Identify the problem, find the solution, and practice it consistently until you can do it. This is my overarching approach to getting better at the guitar. My name's Aaron Carrington, and in this video, I'm gonna share with you more about this approach and also how you can apply it to the following four areas, addressing one specific problem in each. And those four areas are chord changes, bar chords, scales, and strumming. Let's first of all address the approach itself and some thoughts that you might want to contend with with this approach. Identify the problem. This really comes down to your level of awareness. Some people are a little bit more aware of their body than others. Some people come from a musical family and so they're kind of a bit more musically aware. I would say that most people fall into the category of having an average level of awareness whenever they're learning anything new. And so they're not necessarily able to hear that there is a problem or they can't hear the problem in enough detail. So this is where a teacher comes in because obviously you're gonna be tapping into a teacher's experience, which is what you're doing right now, okay? The next step is finding a solution. Again, this is the reason you're on this video because you're seeking solutions, so kudos to you for doing that. But maybe, again, a teacher is something that you can consider here. If that's not something that you want to pay for or can afford, then perhaps consider saving up for an online course. But you really need someone to be able to give you the correct solution because that feeds into the third part of the approach, which is practicing it consistently until you can do it. If you're practicing consistently, but you're not quite practicing the right thing, then you're going to be consistently practicing something that's kind of substandard or not really serving you very well. And it's not going to be as efficient and you won't reach your goal as quickly. And that last one, by the way, practicing it consistently, that's where most people tend to fall short they struggle to find that 15 minutes per day that they can spend on their guitar playing. You've really got to think long term, okay? I always say it's about months and years, not days and weeks, but you've got to be consistent with that practice. So how can we now take this approach and apply it to the four areas we talked about? Let's start with chord changes. Now, as far as chord changes are concerned, what I generally see is people can grasp chords, right? They can get chords and they can make them sound relatively clear. And I'm talking really about these standard open chords. So G, D, E minor, and C, let's say. But sometimes what people will do is they'll continually try to practice those four chords in that order. But what I would recommend you do is you break it down and only practice going from G to D, provided that is one that you're actually struggling with, and isolate that and turn it into a five minute routine as part of your 15 minutes practice, okay? Isolate that single change, set a timer on your phone and you're just gonna sit there and go G, D, G, D. You might even try it without actually strumming the chord. You might just do the fingerings of each chord and just watch that left hand carefully and pay very careful attention to where those fingers are going and try to visualize, try to place little dots on those locations because all of that is gonna to contribute towards the speed at which you can do the chord change. So I'm hoping you can see that we've identified a problem, found the solution, and now we have to practice it consistently until we can do it. Bar chords, how can we do this with bar chords? Well, commonly people will find themselves playing an F bar chord first. And the reason for that is because it's in open position with your C's and your D's and your G's and your E minors, etc. It's around those first three frets, okay? But an F bar chord is actually hardest to play at the first fret and for two reasons. Reason number one is because you're so close to the nut here and you've got to 
push down against the nut. You've got the resistance from the nut because you're so close to it. And reason number two is because the frets are a little bit wider at this part of the neck and so the fingers have to stretch even more and that puts a little bit more strain on your wrist. So why not take this bar cord and move it up to fret five? It's the same shape and this would be an A bar cord at fret five by the way. And then gradually move that chord downwards. So we've identified the problem, found a solution, and then you would have to practice that consistently until you can do it. The next one is scales. Let's say, for example, somebody's trying to play a C major scale in open position but they're struggling to hit the right strings. They just can't seem to hit the right strings every single time. Well, what I commonly see with students is they do what I like to call the floating hand. Their hand floats above. Now, there are certain genres of music for advanced players like gypsy jazz, for example, where the, the hand does float above. But for beginners, you need some consistency and you need some reliability and you need an anchor point. So let me demonstrate the floating hand first of all. This is, this is what you don't want. What you want to be doing is putting your part of your hand here onto the bridge and that provides you with a solid anchor. So as you're playing the scale, your hand isn't moving around in midair like it would be if you had it in this floating hand position. Another reason not to do the floating hand is because you get lots of additional string noise as well and you'll, you'll notice that more on an electric guitar through an amplifier, you'll notice lots of additional string noise. Whereas if your hand is on the bridge, and just dampening the start point of the string slightly, you'll get a lot less string noise. Your playing will be a lot, a lot cleaner. And the last area to address is strumming. So with strumming, people commonly strum quite stiff if you know, strumming seems to fall into one of two camps, or at least it does at the moment with current students. They're either really struggling with it, or they're just able to do it, and they just get that wrist motion. So strumming wants to come from the wrist. The ones that struggle tend to be trying to do it from the elbow, and it tends to be a little bit stiff. So let me demonstrate the difference in sound. So if I was doing a stiff version of strumming, you can see all the movement there is coming from my elbow. Whereas if I do it from the wrist, you can see quite clearly that there is a rotation of the wrist that's happening. I do have another video which details strumming and I filmed it from an angle looking down on the guitar. So you can kind of see the guitar as I might see it. And I demonstrate kind of the arc of the wrist that needs to happen and lots of other things to do with strumming. So if strumming is something you're struggling with, I strongly urge you to check out that video. Of course, I would say that because it helps me out, right? <laughs> At least I'm honest about it. Um, okay, so hopefully you found some value in being able to identify the problem, find the solution, and then knowing that you have to practice it consistently, consistently until you can do it. Okay, I hope this video provides you with a little bit of insight and a little bit of motivation. As per usual, if you hit the like button, the thumbs up, that tells the YouTube algorithm to promote this video to other players just like you that might benefit from it. Subscribe if you haven't already. And if you really find this valuable, then please, there's a donate button in the description where it'll take you over to buymeacoffee.com and you can essentially buy me my next coffee, which will make me very, very happy. As usual, thank you for watching this video and I'll see you in the comments section. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.